the speech today, and you can see the importance of uh, having, well, I've just had a green light, but Caroline in particular in Parliament. Uh, I hope everyone uh, here will be voting in next year's general election, perhaps particularly if you live in the right constituency. Uh, and so, um, yes, do we, have, do we have questions? So, um, I'd like to know what we think our next, um, our next success might be. Well, do you have a, a sense of what you think would be the most? Well, I, I hear you talking about fighting on so many yes. animals, which is, which is fantastic. There are, there are so many injustices and so many yes. things. Um, and occasionally something happens that, you know, gives us all hope that, um, that, that progress is being made. And I guess the last really big one was, was banning fox hunting. That was the one that, you know, just felt really big. We've been fighting for it for such a long time. Yeah. And it was a, an incredibly, um, yeah, sort of, yeah. felt, felt, felt like we were everywhere. So I'm, I'm kind of asking what's going to be the next, the next one. <laughs> CCTV, possibly, in, in small houses. I mean, I think it's something that connects with with the whole consumption of, of, of food. I mean, taking it back to your point, whether or not we can get more of a, of a shift towards people recognising that their own choices when they're making choices about what they eat has massive impacts. And CCTV, CCTV in, in small houses might feel like, you know, for some, many of you in the room, you don't want any small houses at all, but for as long as they are there, then taking those steps. And just getting people, because what I think CCTV Houses will do is just remind people that meat doesn't end up on their plate in some kind of you know, magical fashion. I mean, I mean, an animal has been slaughtered, and, and our whole industrialised agricultural system is designed to make us forget that when you see your bit of cling filled thing in, in the fridge in the supermarket. The connection between that and, and the process that's gone before for most people is, is completely unthought of. And so the more we can get people to begin to think about it, the more they're likely to say, actually, that's pretty horrendous, however the meat is, 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 is created. So there might be something around that, which can then link as well to the health, because we all know that, that there's too much um, meat being consumed in terms of human health, as well as the animal uh, welfare and animal rights arguments, um, as well as the link as well to climate change, because we know that um, you know, so much of the methane and, and CO2 emissions and so forth are linked to industrialised agriculture as well. So that's beginning to sound a bit raw, but, but it may even just be that something like the CCTV and the slaughterhouses could begin to open up that, that wider debate. <coughs> so please let me have your ideas. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm back, but uh, uh, so if they do the box in the fit and then they claim it's an accident, and I want to go through the party because uh, having sort of influence and trying to get dogs to be muzzled, obviously, so they can drink, drink water. Because then that way they can go over the Jordan enough to kill foxes and it's common like that at all, you know. And, um, so, um, yeah, because um, it's just sort of uh, to the background now, but they're out there every week. Yeah. Um, we're getting with deer and pears. And, yes. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. yeah so. so, Jeff, we're out of that. Sorry, another hand saboteur. Um, it, <laughs> not to great on my colleague, but if we could actually completely stop hunting with hands. Can you speak up a bit? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. The, the hunt in this country, as well as all the foxes that they illegally kill every week, and believe me, they do, wherever they stop stopping them. Um, you might not know this, but the 300 hunts across this country kill 11,000 hunting hounds every year. Most of them are less than a year old. Most of those are killed, if they're killed that young, they're killed by having their brains smashed out on the concrete floor of the kennels because the 10p for a bullet is too much. Um, if we're going to do something in Parliament, stop hunting with hounds, we need to stop all of the hunting, all the pretend drag hunting, the whole lot, because 11,000 hounds a year just isn't okay. We, we're trying to collate the number of horses they kill, but almost every time a hunt goes out, a horse dies. Um, it, it's horrific, and the only way to stop it is that there's no more red coats in our countryside. And what's great Most people in the room would probably also be shocked to learn that up in Scotland anything up to 4,000 seals a year are culled by the fish farming industry. Hundreds of thousands of farmed salmon and trout starved to death in the fish farms. We've been up there, we've got the direct evidence, first-hand evidence, but we just can't get any political party, anybody in any position of authority to take up that campaign and run with it. So if the Green could do that, we'd be very grateful indeed. Thank you. I would love to talk to you. I think Caroline Allen is here. Yeah, she'll be in the house of the animals. Um, and, and let's definitely talk, because that 11,000 figure was, I hadn't heard the figure as well.
that high, so that's, that's hideous. So what you were saying about the, the fish pond and so forth, I would love to take up, so let's, let's talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for coming here. Great pleasure as well. Um, I'm talking about very much like to see what's obviously the price of drop and the way that our consumption, whether it's paper or words or something <coughs> I know most about karma, is just destroying the virgin forest. And this is just not talk about in the public arena. And where, um, for example, the, the uh, government has recently, I don't know if you know, um, decided to accept biofuels, uh, sorry, palm oil as a large scale biofuel. So they're, they're, putting, they're actually supporting, with our electricity bills, by the way, they, they actually are um, promoting palm oil as a biofuel, and palm oil is directly responsible for human rights like abuses, animal, um, completely working out animal populations. You know, the Javanese tiger's already gone. And now the Sumatran time is maybe two men left, so I reckon that, that population is going to collapse at any minute. And I really, really would like to see that. In the <laughs> a strong point, and there was a really strong campaign as well to try to stop the governments uh, and the EU from, from, from doing this because it just seems so ironic and so just just so perverse to pretend that biofuels are somehow in any way at all environmentally friendly. I mean, that, that's what adds insult to this is a hideous story that you describe, doing all of the damage that you absolutely outline, and yet at the same time, they want us to try to believe that biofuels are somehow uh, an environmentally friendly alternative. I mean, and there was a big campaign, we need to keep the pressure up, because as, as you say, it's, it's happening on a daily basis, these animals are, are literally being driven to extinction. And I guess some people feel that the battle's over, but we've got to keep the pressure on them. Uh, and also, of course, in foods, even yeah. even so-called vegan foods, I think. So it's something that we maybe need to be a bit aware of. Um, regarding the EU petition, I'm assuming it's the same as what you just said. Yeah. The subjects that are voted by the general public regarding animal welfare, that, even though they haven't hit the target of 100,000, does your committee look at it? It's a really take, good question. Um, there isn't a um, systematic way in which the uh, all-party group looks at those, and perhaps there should be, but what we are doing um, at, well, not just the all-party group, but a number of MPs generally, are looking to revise the way in which that um, number 10 petition site works, because it's not that user-friendly. There's never any particular support or advice for people who are putting up the petitions as to the best way to phrase them to get, you know, to get the debate that you want. So um, there is a proposal that's being discussed by I think, one of the constitutional affairs committees at the moment about how we could reform that whole petition system so that there's actually a, a petition um, secretariat, there's a petitions committee like there is in the European Parliament, so that you could begin to get people um, more engaged with the process and perhaps not necessarily needing such a high bar, 100,000, but if there's something that's really needing to get momentum and the MPs already think, hang on, then that's a really good point, then you can begin to, to, to push that out to the right committees to start working on much sooner rather than waiting for 100,000. Would, so would that reform include that once it's been brought to the House, to the House for discussion, <coughs> three line width has been imposed? Oh, that would be amazing. That, that is another, that is another um, battle. Um, and in one way, it would make complete sense to combine the two, as you, as you suggest, because you're actually trying to get the will of the people heard properly in Parliament then if you do all these other reforms to get these petitions listened to more directly, if, as you imply, you've still got three-line whips, then, then that doesn't help you very much. So a separate uh, campaign that, that I am absolutely uh, trying to run is, is to, to reduce the power of the whips. It is absolutely shocking to see how much parliamentary business is just sewn up by, by you know, deals that are done behind closed doors, essentially. And I, I would like to get rid of it completely, frankly. I think that when you elect an MP, that you, you know, if you, if you combined it with recall, so that if your MP suddenly went A1 and started to do things that were completely against the manifesto they stood on, you could recall them properly, not with this um, pretense of a recall that the government's come up with. Uh, but if you combine that with, with, with allowing MPs to, to be able to properly represent their constituents rather than being basically told to do whatever the works tell them, that would be a really good way of trying to make this Parliament a bit more. We've got a big black hole in the NHS, I think double spending on the NHS. We've got a 
heavier an aging population, and most of the people in this country die of heart disease or diabetes type 2 or lots of cancers and diseases which are reversible with the diet. In America, fans of the government are more than the diseases. But we must know that the main livestock and dairy cancer have loads of money to promote their junk foods. Um, how about some funding for vegan doctors and nurses to deal with these diseases and take the pressure off the NHS so that funds are available to people who really need them and to help people to take charge of their own lives? Everybody in this room has to be vegan, but we can't get any money to go out and teach it. So we say we organize a vegan pledge in London. We can do that once a year every week because we have to work. But we really get some money for this. <laughs> preventing people from getting sick or indeed as you're saying reversing the sickness if they have and certainly the better that is. In order to make that case as strongly as possible, maybe I can work with you after because what, what I don't know is where to look for the best evidence for this because in order to be able to present a rigorous case that's shown that you can reduce your, your, your spending on a health service as a result of doing this, that would be one of the best ways of getting this government to look at it. They won't look at it sadly from an animal rights perspective but they might just look at it if you can demonstrate what you've just said. So there's some really good evidence out there that shows that. I would love to be able to you know, ask questions on it and, and begin to put, put that into the public domain in Parliament. Yeah, I've met the top doctors that are doing that in the press and I don't know that here. Well, give, give me the stuff afterwards. Yeah. I want to be giving you their contacts. Yes, yeah, so the lady next to them. I have a question in relation to all of this is saying, saying that we need to look at the country now, and now there is some sign. Other people have been saying in that sense that how do we 
begin to turn the table so that the, the vegan menus, which will lead to fewer costs later on anyway, as you're saying, in terms of health service and everything else, then why not give them a, an upfront benefit through the kinds of subsidies and support that you're suggesting? I think it's something, information, providing information for them, because I've spoken to a lot of restaurant owners that, you know, they have a dish to be veganised, and, and, and actually, yeah, we can do this, we can do that. And I'll say to them, well, this is fantastic. You know, the chef has made a brilliant job at it. You know, you could put together an extra menu and you get so many yeah. customers. And I think if they have that guidance, like, you know, to help fund them, the guidance to be able to do that, um, and obviously the benefits of, oh, we could save money if we do a vegan menu, then yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people were encouraged to do that. Yeah. Thank you. 
My friends are actually seriously making themselves ill. There's no homes. I've got five. I didn't want any more cats. I've got five. I've got five. I can't stroke them. I can't touch them. I love them to bits. And I've had to start getting off a few years now. And this is the situation across the country, but very much so in London. Can we not put pressure on Carlton to do something about this terrible problem? It's a really the cats are going through that, <coughs> and so are my friends. Mm -hmm. It's a really good point. I think Caroline Hogan is going to be probably on this one. I mean, I think there's obviously the wider point about you know, irresponsible pet ownership and the many things that we need to do, but I think there's a particular issue with cats. Um, in the, the legal standing of cats is somewhat different to dogs. Well, it should be. So that's, that's a very good point. Well, that's something. Be but that's well, what I'm saying. Well, so I'm like a teacher. If we set those rules and we'd like to change those rules because it is wrong that you know, the, the legal position of cats is not as strong as dogs. You know, and that's, that's well, ridiculous. So it's, yes. it's about changing the law and then actually you could enforce councils to have rules and to actually do something because the different legal position at the moment um, actually means that cats are, you know, don't have any rights, if you like, compared to dogs, which at least have some, but, you know, there's a much wider position about the way the media cover, you know, how we keep pets, about irresponsible pet ownership, um, and all the emphasis has been on dogs, and like chipping, and you're absolutely right that we need to think about cats. I think we are definitely agreeing with you. We're just like, yeah, there's a bit of a we need to sort out as well. really strong if you dealt with trees. Yes. I'm going to take two, two more questions and get to that. All right. Oh, okay. Um, I, of course, agree with you um, about parking the animals, but I think we want to keep in mind that a future where most animals can't be is sadly rather a long way off. And in the meantime, if we can ameliorate <coughs> some of the terrible cruelty in the production of food animals, animals that should be done. I'm horrified for being in supermarkets at how many, many meals have chicken, even in Hindu meals in a culture which is traditionally Hindu, traditionally vegetarian. And <clears throat> the situation in body units is, despite some sort of ameliorating causes and all, is absolutely appalling with overcrowding, cannibalism, sick and ill animals not detected because the numbers are so absolutely vast. In fact, pictures of that duck farm where there was an outbreak of disease to sort of emphasize that. And so I'm going to hurry you to the Oh, rest sorry, of, yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think it would help if actually there was compulsory labeling of chicken meat. What's the big yeah. 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 Now, I mean, the, the point you make is a, <clears throat> a good one, that while we want to have a, a future where people are not eating meat, for as long as they are, absolutely, let's try to give people more choice so that they can make that choice to, to not eating broiler chicken and, and, and so forth. Um, I do think that in this country, the possibility of, of, of getting to a future where at least we're all eating an awful lot less meat is, is very possible, but I worry that what we're also doing, I think we need to keep our eye on this, is that we are exporting this very high meat, intensively reared meat model to lots of other developing countries, including through our own aid budget. So, <clears throat> as ever, it's about trying to keep our, our minds on both what we're doing here in our own practice, but making sure that we're not exporting the worst of our own practice. Some of the poorest countries will then get hooked into that same kind of practice. The very last question was right over there. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could say a bit about um, undercover police officers spying and infiltrating the animal rights movement mm. and what's been doing to expose that and how people go down for That's a really good question that, you, that you're ending on there. So this is about, about undercover police um, getting involved in um, animal rights groups and um, it's something that I've done quite a bit of work on in, in, in Parliament. And what it's revealed is that there is a complete chaos, really, over what, what the rules are. So you ask the, the ministers what they think the rules are in terms of what police are and are not allowed to do. And you come back with a very different answer from what the police chiefs themselves say is, is allowed to be done or not done. 
the idea that at a time when the government's spending so much of its time and resource telling us that the big threat is, is, is international terrorism, the idea that, that getting involved in, in all of these animal rights groups is a good use of resources apart from the human rights issues is just ludicrous. And so I think there is a process now to be trying to hold that to account and trying to shine a spotlight on what's being done. Um, because it's, apart from anything else, and as I say, there's some pretty, very strong human rights arguments. But again, because that doesn't get very far with this government, you could at least be talking about where to put priority resources. And the priority resources right now do not need to be the number one to towards it. Fine. So, so just five, finally, three little things. Uh, um, please um, think about everything Caroline's been saying when it comes to voting next year. Um, please sign our CCCB position on the London website. And this we have to go